Hello, listeners. Just a quick note before we start the program. I'm so excited to let you know about a brand new Berkeley Online podcast coming this fall. It's called The Roaring Crowd Fund, and you can check out the trailer now on any service where you find your podcasts. Personally, I'd suggest you do it via iTunes and press subscribe and write a review because nothing spreads the word for podcasts better than good old-fashioned word of mouth. Well, it's not that old-fashioned if you're just writing a review on your computer. Anyway, the roaring crowdfund coming from Berkeley Online in the fall of 2018. Check it out. And now, drumroll please. Take note of Tanya Donnelly. She is the guest on this edition of the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. So you know Tanya Donnelly as A, a guitarist and occasional lead singer for the band Throwing Muses, which she began with her stepsister Kristen Hirsch as a teenager, B, as a guitarist and backup singer for the first couple of releases by The Breeders, a band she founded with Pixies bassist and singer Kim Deal, C, the leader of the band Belly, whose 1993 song Feed the Tree was an inescapably huge hit at the time that still holds up to this day, and whose Untogether tune from their Grammy-nominated album Star was recently covered by Courtney Barnett and Kurt Vile, weirdly marking his third cameo in the Music Is My Life series. D, you know her as a captivating solo performer. E, as a postpartum doula. F, all of the above. So as I said, she and her stepsister Kristen Hirsch began throwing muses when they were both teenagers, but as with a majority of the artists featured on this show, it all began for her with the Beatles. But Tanya's Beatles beginnings as interpreted by her young mind were a little different from most. And in fact, I actually thought that Abbey Road was a children's album <laughs> because my parents used to play it all the time and mm. I was little and I and I the imagery in those songs I really connected with um so that's probably the I think that's the first album I remember yeah um that's a really great thing because yeah. it really is a children's album isn't it like yeah. but it sounds like it I mean if yeah. you're not listening to what happens in Maxwell's Silver Hammer yeah but even that is like a Grimm's fairy tale yeah. I mean it's not far off from, right you know from what you're being the stories that I was being told anyway. And right. those are stories, you know. The storytelling on that album is very clear. It, there's a narrative. Yep. There are characters. That's great. I love that album. It's, and it's was were the Beatles the first thing you learned to play as well? or? Yeah, Kristen and I rediscovered them when we were about 14. On my, It was my 14th birthday party, in fact. We watched Hard Day's Night and um, from that point on, we were just, I mean, people throw the word obsessed around a lot, but it's really pretty much exclusively the Beatles for years for me. That's great. <laughs> At that, From that point on, and that, you know, that's how I learned how I played guitar learning their songs. So yeah, they were monumental. Tell me a little bit about when you and Kristen first started playing together. Who, who picked up the guitar first and who, uh, just explain a little bit about how that all came about. Kristen first. Yeah. She, her dad used to write songs, um, or possibly still does, I don't know. But we would go over to his house and he would play songs that he had written, including the chorus for Not Too Soon. Really? Which ended up becoming Not wow. Too Soon. I never knew that. Yeah, he wouldn't does let he get me co no? He would not. I wrote, I, I, I went over this with him a couple of times when we, before Ramona was released and said, listen, I, I just want to put your name on them or give you some. And he's just sort of, I do it. I did it because I love it. And, you know, it was a short conversation, but it, I really regret, to be honest. I yeah. regret not not doing it anyway. I shouldn't have listened right, to him. Right. Because he, you know, he, the base of the chorus was a song from a song of his. That's amazing. Yeah. What was the verse like in his version? Um, He's sort of a Dylan-esque writer, so it was similar to the to the chorus in melody. And I can't really remember. God, that would be amazing to dig up, though. Yeah, do put that demo yeah. on online right. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That'd he's be really a cool. Great. He's a good. Have him sue you, <laughs> and then yeah. get publicity for. Well, he, there's actually another <laughs> song of his that I've always wanted to cover, and I will someday. So maybe I could do it with that. Yeah. 
That's terrific. So, but was that the first song you ever wrote? Because I know you didn't, you no. weren't writing regularly for the Muses albums. I wrote, no, that, yeah, that was not the first. And actually, I didn't do anything with that until Ramona, really. Mm -hmm. he, he also wrote the basis for the chorus of Dizzy, too. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the huge unsung hero. He's a huge unsung hero. Again, uncredited <laughs> by amazing. his, you know, by, by choice. Yeah. Um, let me think. What was the first? I The first song that I ever wrote was a song about Kent State. Okay. A very passionate and not very good song. Yeah. But that's those are so beautiful though because you can look back and you can see your own naivete and yeah. and just and just how I really wanted to to speak to this that you know I right. wanted to weigh in on this at the age of 14 and yeah. didn't really have the tools yet. So okay, so you're 14 and that's mm -hmm. Kent State has just really happened, right? Well, no, it okay. happened. That was it, I was fourteen and eighty. So, but my oh, okay. parents were still very focused. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, they, you know, they were both very involved in the civil rights movement and in the um, anti-Vietnam movement, and they were extremely active. And you know, we stayed with my grandparents for a bit during those years, and mm -hmm. they were. So it was something that was that and other landmark moments grim grim landmark moments yeah. um so it wasn't was pretty, it wasn't a case yeah. of when neil young's version came out you felt like he beat you to the punch or something <laughs> <laughs> like, no that's a beautiful yeah. that song yeah kind of kills me to this day but so you so you began to write at about 14 and in the band what was your reluctance to write for the band I wasn't so much reluctant as it was just um, Chris it's just always been more prolific than I am and continues to be to this day. It's sort of I have a much more erratic writing schedule, I guess. Uh -huh. It's not really a schedule. It's just sometimes I have these extremely prolific periods where things come very quickly and then several months will pass and it'll be a slog. Yeah. Um, so it's just that's just sort of I have a site I have a cycle and she has a stream <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's just a different way of writing and or different timing right um, and so with that just really came down to just she'd come into practice with 20 songs and I'd have five or you know um, so that as the years went on I had a backlog of it was more you know a backlog of songs and things that I didn't feel like we're, you know, necessarily Muses songs. And that's when Kim and I started writing mm -hmm. together and started The Breeders. And the initial deal with The Breeders was going, you know, Pod was going to be Kim's and then I was going to have the second one. Oh, and I actually, didn't know that. Yeah, the de and the demos for Star actually say Breeders on them. Oh, wow. From that's Ford insane. Apache. Yeah. So did she... She played on them. She played on them? Yeah, <laughs> she played so on, that's the, on, why, a, on a few of the demos. So yeah. that's why Gail wasn't in the picture and there's only three people in the first video and yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, because we weren't... Well, in, initially when the, when I left the Muses, Fred Avon came with me to form Belly and then he actually left immediately after recording so we never toured with Fred we mm -hmm. Leslie Langston from the early muses came in and subbed for a bit our friend Dylan Roy subbed we had uh, you know a couple of people kind of sit in mm -hmm. and then, and then we found on, Gail you played on Safari though right <laughs> I did yeah yeah so was that any sort of contentious issue with Hey, I thought I was gonna do the next album and it would be the Breeders or No, because by then I had already formed Valley. Oh okay. Yeah, we had already she had committed to like a three hundred year tour with the big season <laughs> <laughs> and I had uh, been talking to the Gorman brothers. Fred and I had been talking to the yeah. Gormans about starting a band. So no, we had already decided to um do things separately. Safari was just sort of my postscript. Right. <laughs> right. Tell me about that time when you first Put the breeders together and how did it come about was it kind of you got a taste for wow i like putting songs on records uh, <laughs> you know with not too soon <laughs> i want to do this more yeah and some of it also to be honest was just um you know kim and i just 
had become really close on the Muses Pixies tour and just were excited about hanging out together and playing together. Mm-hmm. It was as simple as that. Yeah. Um, the the pl- there was no plan in the initial stage. Yeah. The plan sort of came later when I said I have a batch of songs, and at that point we had sort of said, well, how about the second one? We'll we'll focus on on mine. Right. You know. Right. That's great, and, and yeah. it's funny too to think of you know back at that time it was like twenty. 26 to seven years 300 ago years. Oh, 300 <laughs> <laughs> so but it's yeah. funny to think of both of you being musicians based in Boston mm. um, <laughs> what was that like the scene back then and you know I was first becoming aware of it at that time yeah. but I my mom wouldn't let me go to all the things of course <laughs> but um, would that be you and Kim just hanging out at her apartment or your apartment and making up her music, place, yeah, yeah, primarily, and she had like a sort of a big adult condo. So I would go over, go over there, and we would, we'd write, right yeah, there. Did, yeah, so that's what yeah. I'm did now. they did they have money at that point? Uh, was no, that no, no, this was pre- to... No, I mean okay. from my perspective, it was yeah. <laughs> it was an apartment. But from my perspective, you know, she just had a, an actual legit job. Yeah, that was the only oh, that's right. <laughs> Didn't she work? She worked in an office yeah. or something. Yep. When did uh, you recognize, oh, I have a viable career in this music thing? Pro- oh, God. I, I don't know that I've ever landed in that on that. Really? I mean, because I, I've always had, even early on, just this sort of Prussian sense that this was all extremely fragile. Yeah. You know, and I lived accordingly. You know, I, I never felt like, all right, Okay, now I can really settle into the, mm-hmm. into this. Everything's going to be on a permanent, you know, sort of plateau from this point on. That doesn't really, I think, for bands like in our scope and genre, I don't think that really happens. Yeah. I mean, I hate to sound. I'm not being negative. I'm just being. I'm just. You know, it's it 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 it's it is what it is. Right. You know, and I think that the earlier on you grasp that, the healthier your relationship to your own music is going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was there ever a time when your relationship with your music felt tenuous because that factored in? I mean, of course, there have been plenty of times when I have wished it were more secure, Mm -hmm. wished it were more stable, wished that I had a five-year plan, you know, because you don't. Right. But it's never changed the way way I approach music itself ever and I've always been surrounded by people who are somewhat like-minded so that's never been been an issue for the most part and I'm also not ashamed afraid concerned you know about working a day job either right you know I I have another line of work now and that that's to me is just sort of life I mean what is it um I'm I'm actually on a break right now as I'm saying this in full disclosure (laughs) I've sort of put this business on hold for a while, but I'm a uh, doula, postpartum doula. Oh, as awesome! Well. We had a doula at my son's oh, birth. Oh, did you? Yeah, it was okay. so awesome. Birth, yeah. yeah. I don't do birth work, but I think okay. I'm actually going to retrain and go back into yeah. that, to that now. That it my was kids so are helpful, older. just because you never know who's going to be on staff at the moment, mm-hmm. and you know whoever your doctor was. I mean, we did the midwives at Mount Auburn. So did and I. they were so great. They're amazing. Yeah. But yeah. E- even them, you never knew who was going to be on staff. To, so to just have this other person that you knew was definitely going to be there was right. huge. How old yeah, are your kids? Amazing. Uh, 19 and uh, 12. Okay. What, what's your relationship with them in music? Do they And how uh, throughout their lives have they known about you know, both your music and your husband's music. And I mean, I imagine you'd introduce them early, but how? at what point did they register? Oh. Mom and dad do this for a living? Well, Gracie toured, my older daughter toured with us until okay. until she went to, you know, started school. And and they they've been present for almost all of it. They've mm-hmm. were raised in studios and clubs. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of part of their their life and they're interested in music, they're music fans. They sort of dabble in a few instruments, but they're primarily both of them are are have different interests. They're more theater. Mm-hmm. Theater kit, you know, my older daughter is very focused on Shakespeare, and she's also a pol- pol- politics major. And my younger is um, 100% Broadway. <laughs> yeah. So, um, which is great and fun. Yeah. Um, but that's really their their 
they do have a focus on music, but it's in my in the case of my younger daughters, it's very different than mine, and the older it's more sort of it's woven in. It's mm-hmm. not the focus. So. That's interesting. Yeah, that's good because it's like you gave them a background to know what it's all about. And then they've taken that and gone to a different place with it almost. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. To backtrack a little bit, though, let's talk about, uh, you were mentioning how Kim Deal played on the initial recordings for uh, Star. Mm-hmm. And at what point, I guess, and, and for the muses, too, we didn't really address this, but this would be a convenient way to tie them both in. <laughs> at what point did you say, I'm officially leaving this project, you continue without me, for with, both, with both Kristen and Kim. It was during the recording of Ramona that I told Kristen and Dave. And then, but I mean, honestly, that was such a, they, I grew up with them. I've known yeah. them since I was five. And it, that was such a non-event. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, every, there, was te- there were tears. And yeah. of course, there was emotion. I'm not, you know, obviously, but it wasn't contentious. And it was just sort of, it was coming and everyone sort of knew it because mm-hmm. we, by that point, just read each other so well and knew each other so well. Yeah. I think with Kim, I'm trying to remember, I think it was in Dayton. And that was sort of a little more a series of steps because we weren't, it wasn't, that wasn't a proclamation. It was more, eh, things are looking logistically like this might be difficult. Would you mind if I took it to other people? Well, let's wait. Let's think about it. It was sort of... um Again, not contentious, right. but but just, I mean, a lot of these decisions were based on just pure pragmatism. Right. So had she moved back to the Midwest or something? Or? Yeah. So post-pod, pre-safari, because we rehearsed for safari in Dayton. Right. And I'm but then terrible when... Terrible with chronology. And really, <laughs> yeah. just years are... Well, you need landmarks to help it. You know, yeah. That's... Well, and also there was so much packed into, in between, for me, in between... 87 and 95 yeah (laughs) that sometimes i can't i can't tease out it's more like what month was it as opposed to what year was it sometimes so oh that's wild it's funny because now i look back and just obviously we were young but we did not we didn't feel young it just we really just felt like we were on top of it all and in some ways we really were you know and Kristen just always had a really good sense of where she wanted to go with things. It's funny because I, this, you know, just the, the, the courtship involved at that time was a bit overwhelming sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're what, like 19 or 20 at that point? Yeah. Yeah. For, so the 4AD thing happened significantly. We were 17 when we started talking to them. Right. This was 1920 when we started with the major. Right. And that, that was... I mean, obviously, very surreal, and yeah. and also, I think the first sense of some of these people are lying to us, <laughs> 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 which we hadn't encountered clearly right. with four AD. You know, we had this utopian first label experience, yeah, and so being thrown into the you know uh, proverbial Shark Tank, <laughs> yeah, was a little bit of jarring. And I think we have good intuition when it comes to who's being. Up front and who isn't in a right. way. Um, so that was sort of that was an odd learning curve, but the decisions that we made were, you know, internal band mm-hmm. decisions. At the end of the day, we weren't, you know, no one. I can't say that anybody has swept us off our feet yeah. at that time. It was sort of more what's the smart, you know, what makes the most sense. And with Sire, they kind of came to us with this, with an idea that no longer exists, which is sort of building your career you know just as opposed to what's your song (laughs) yeah you know they we were in development Mm -hmm. and we sort of liked that they were using that kind of language because it felt like commitment and that we'd have some freedom and that they trusted us as artists which they did for the most part you know we had free reign for the most part with them which was nice Right, and so that is why we ended up going, mm-hmm. going with them because that because that was a conversation that hadn't cut you know hadn't been framed that way until we talked, started talking to them. And I can't remember. Did you were the Billy albums with Sire? Um, reprise at that point. I'm trying okay. to remember. It was yeah. all Warner under the Warner's umbrella, but right. but it, we switched. At one point, we switched from one to the other, 
And a lot of that was just going with Howie Klein wherever he went. Um, right. So. So then, you quit. You quit the Muses. You quit the mm-hmm. Breeders, and and here it is. You have these Breeders demos, and mm-hmm. you say, "All right." Well, I'm I'm putting words in your own mouth. I'm so, no, no, that's so, fine. I'm just trying to. That's probably helpful it out. to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, I guess, how you arrived at that at what Belly would be. Initially, when I left, I had sort of a, I had there was some pressure from the label here in the states to, to go solo and 482. I think they the, in, in the first few months of that break, they just sort of inc- wanted it to be solo, and I really did not. Right. I wasn't ready for that. I wanted to be in a band again. I wanted to go back to Newport and find musicians because Newport, uh, Rhode Island, is just fertile soil for music. There are so many wonderful musicians and songwriters there. And I, you know, when I, when we were young, everyone was in a band. So that's, that was my natural instinct was to go home, which was the smart thing to do. Right. And so once I put the band together and we presented it as a fait accompli and this is who we are, everybody jumped on board immediately. Yeah. So. Yeah. Tell me about because that was a crazy time in the music industry mm-hmm. where the post nirvana buzz and yeah. and do you feel that you benefited from that or do you feel oh, sure. yeah <laughs> well i don't know um, it's like yeah i mean at that point yeah i mean i benefited from coming off the forward mo- motion of the real ramona i mm-hmm. absolutely and the breeders you know that that definitely we, I already had, again, I'm going to use the word team in place who had faith and who, coming from two really, you know, successful indie bands at the time, that absolutely helped. Mm-hmm. But I think we weren't, we never had the hope, you know, never had hopes or any expectation for what ac- ended up happening in that first year, though. Right, right. Do I don't you think f- anyone, anyone yeah. did, to be honest. No, no one was uh, working it that way and we weren't thinking about it that that way so I think it took everybody the groundswell that happened it took everyone by surprise so was there any difficulty adjusting to it or um not out of the gate because we were it's such a tight unit it was really kind of just about us as far as the four of us were concerned um and we had um Gary Smith and Ford Apache and that machine that managerial and recording machine behind us um so that was also you know hugely helpful and protective and yeah the first couple of years were i think it was after king that we really started to feel over more overwhelmed Mm -hmm. um and part of that was just not taking a breather and i hate to complain about that because it really misrepresents who we are as people because we are hard for very hardworking people. We all, we come from hardworking families, but I, there just wasn't, you know, just not it, just not being home, mm-hmm. not having a day, not having, you know, um, that took its toll. And then also just we just sort of had, a, you know, I don't know. It's we, we've decided to we're not really talking about what ha- things that happened. And to be honest, that's probably wise because I think we have a very <laughs> Very murky memory right. at this point, anyway, and it doesn't matter. Right? No, no. You know, I'm, it's yeah. I guess I was asking that just because of you know how strange of a time that was, yeah. and then how we earlier talked about you know if any business like tainted the art kind of thing, or if there was any pressure of sure you got to do this. You got to do a follow-up that's bigger than the first one. Yeah, and I think we kind of um, bumped up against that by saying, actually, we're going to make a live album Mm -hmm. with Glenn Johns, who wants to do a live album also, and it's just going to be, we're going to use four buttons. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Old school style. So King was recorded Um, like that? Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, there are some overdubs, you know, vocally and um, backups and stuff like that. Right. But yeah, it's a live, it's live for the most part. That's great. Yeah, um, but yes, you're that. That's it's the to, you know sort of the the old standard story of too many external voices, and that's the one. Whenever someone says, "What would you say to a young band?" and yeah. it's, uh, my answer is always, 
first and foremost, trust yourself and each other and be careful. Not Don't avoid outside opinion and voices because I feel like some of that advice and some of that input was invaluable and enriched us mm -hmm. musically and in terms of business sense or whatever. But you have to know when when it is starting to taint mm -hmm. what you're doing, when it is starting to impact on the actual songwriting, that that gets tricky. It, it is a difficult thing to think about, but also if you think about the bands you were with before, do you feel like that at least gave you some preparation for, okay, this is going to come? It's, I, I always think about it like, like a video game or something. You know, you get to a certain level and then your guy dies or whoever, and then you <laughs> be like, oh, I've been to this level before, and you know, uh, did you at least it's a great feel <laughs> like yeah. like you could were equipped to handle some of the things that came out? No, no, no. And part of that was because Kristen had handled all of that, right. or Kim had handled all of that prior to you know, I being a front person on that level was not something that I was prepared for, and I think just also. In general, we are four very private people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not wallflowers, we're not shy, we're not, you know, but we are, we hold our info close to our chest. And so having a light constantly focused was a little tricky at the time when we didn't know how to, um, how to filter our own information yet. Right, you know? right, right, I'd imagine. So. Tell me about, you know, we're, we're about 25 years on from that now, and is there a Rolling Stone belly cover in your house anywhere? There is not, but yeah. I do have the, um, in the basement we have like a, Dean and I have, my husband and I have a practice slash recording studio in the basement, and we have um, things up on the wall. Yeah. They are not the Rolling Stone cover, um, gold mainly record? just because it's too big. Yeah, the rec gold record. Oh, cool. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think I think it's slipped down in between the glass, and I, I think it just sort of has this sad little display right now. Well, Maybe you should try to fix it. I don't take it out and try it. to play it. Look at it anymore. Is it actually that record? No. I always uh -uh. wondered. It's just a yeah. fake gold yes, record yeah. or real gold, but yeah. a fake record. Yeah. So have you tried? I haven't. Okay. No. <laughs> so you don't know for sure. I don't know what it is. It could be anything. What if it's like Perry Como? I know. Or you something? know what? I haven't even counted the tracks to see if that lines up. That's a good. <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, so okay, that happens, and and then you move on, and it, you start doing some solo work. Mm -hmm. And earlier, you were saying kind of how you treated your muse as kind of a fragile thing, and or, or the your the notion of a career as an artist is a fragile thing. And at that point, what was your mindset carrying on with solo material? I think it was just at that point, I was still at a point in my life where I thought that I might go to college again someday. Okay. Did you go <laughs> so and then drop out? Of, I went for a few months. To, yeah. yeah. Where'd you to, go? To um, URI. Okay. But I was, I, you know, it was wasted. It, it was a, it, it was something I should not. I you know it was something that I did because we were because Dave was going and Kristen was going. But even though we had just been signed and or we were you know we were about to sort of get going mm -hmm. or we were talking at that point. I think. Right. Um, Who have you put uh, throwing and, muses on your uh, application? Did you let's say no, nothing. not nothing in the no, essay or and, anything? No, and um, the, I just I so I really just I went very half heartedly, and it was I, I re, you know I regret that I took up space there mm. <laughs> because I well, my heart wasn't in it, and my, my body was hardly was barely there right, sometimes. Right. <laughs> so, and did you all drop right. out at the same time? No, Dave finished. I think Dave finished the definitely finished. Everyone finished the first year. Yeah. And then we moved to Boston. Yeah. I, I actually moved to moved ahead yeah. of everybody else. Nothing stops a conversation short in Cambridge, Massachusetts, like admitting <laughs> that you didn't go to school. <laughs> no, you had an experience that anybody of that age would much prefer. I feel like. Mm. Did was it a strong thing for you to encourage your daughter to? 
go to higher education. I didn't have to encourage yeah. her at all. She's, yeah. she's just, um, she was, she drove that bus entirely. Yeah, yeah she great. was very, very excited. She's, she's just, you know, always been a strong student. Um, okay, so you thought about going to college, didn't, then mm -hmm. you do your first solo records. And tell me a little bit about that. Uh, the first solo records were sort of, um, the first one, the very first one, Love Songs for Underdogs, that one was sort of treated, that's the only one that feels like that was treated the same way the belly records were in terms of PR and the, you know, the major label machine and, you know, pushing it and doing promo tours and doing press tours and lots of, um, you know, radio festivals and yeah. things to promote on that level. Um, and that is when I personally started to feel done with that level of um, promotional slogging. Like mm -hmm. I just felt like this isn't really meshing with me as a person. You know, I think you just, I was older and I was just getting to a point, Not, I mean, not by I was older, what I mean is I was old enough to start learning who I am and what I want, mm -hmm. not I was older. Right, no, <laughs> and so no, no. I was, Yeah, you, I, know, I, I, you had the it experience. Was just, it, yeah, right, I just was at a point where I started to gain enough confidence to say, I'm not doing this anymore. Right. You got um, to that level of the video game and said, I'm yes, going to turn a I, different right. corner. <laughs> yeah, and, and like to understand what that means in terms of what I can expect in the future also. Right. And then I had my first child and the subsequent albums were from that point on, I'm going to use the word woven again, I'm sorry, That's but fine. woven into my life as opposed to the focus of my life. And right. and music became the thing that it was when I was a teenager again, which yeah. is just sort of a part of my day um, and a natural kind of extension of of me mm -hmm. in a really nice, nice way. Right. Um, so it's funny because you know, just being under the radar, of just that felt so healthy and natural to me. Um, so I consider the place where I landed, even though it always ends up being, you know, in a where are they now sort of thing in terms of, <laughs> it, it, you know. Right. Well, the good thing is I feel like the, in the internet age, there is no where are they now because anybody can look yeah, it up. So I know, those yeah, shows yeah. don't exist. Right. But yeah. um, Although I do end up getting asked to do a lot of interviews of those. Oh, really? Uh, that theme, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> do you do them? I did one and yeah. then I was, I just felt like. Was right. it like a VH1? It was a spin thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, but VH1 did something too that we, yeah. were, we were involuntarily included. Oh. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, thinking back to that time, I mean, I think trying to think of a way to phrase this, but you know, with the where are they now aspect, <laughs> does the money still come in from like, do you, I don't know how the royalty checks work, but do you still like look and say, oh, feed the tree made 20 bucks this week or? That's about it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, those is, numbers are about what? <laughs> but yeah. it is a, something that's itemized and whatnot. Oh, yeah, the yeah, checks. yeah. That's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, we get it's. Um, I don't pick apart the spreadsheet because at this point we're sort of doing everything. We're quartering everything because we yeah. are exhausted by the accounting for the most yeah. part. Um, so it just makes it easier. To, right. Yeah. It's but a funny yeah, thing. it's. It's actually it's what's funny is the things that. More than feed the tree is a song called Broken, which was a B side which got picked up by Twister, the movie Twister, which apparently- Oh, the Laura Dern tornado yes, movie? Yes, <laughs> which apparently did quite well overseas. Wow. Because that ended up being our, in terms of like a, like our most singularly financially beneficial song. It's such a weird little story, but I'm just, I still to this day, I'm like, broken still, yeah. really? <laughs> <laughs> Certain songs, like, I mean, you take something like Untogether, Let's talk yeah, a minute about, about that song. I mean, I remember <laughs> there's a clip of you on YouTube with Tom York saying that and snuggling mm -hmm. afterwards. <laughs> and <laughs> it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. he, he looks uh, very different than he do, does now. Right. And then Courtney Barnett and Kurt Vile oh, yeah. did a version of that. <laughs> right. And 
whenever I think of that song, it's just that, that there's that one moving line of like, she's not touching me now. It's, yeah. When you wrote that, mm -hmm. did you get the same idea that that was a really resonant line? It was for me. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of anger in that line, yeah. which, um, I mean, to this day, we all have people come into our lives who overstep and to use a dramatic word, you know, violate our space and mm -hmm. have no remorse for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I feel like that's why, I think everybody can relate to that person who just emotionally exhausts you. Yeah. You know, this, you know, sort of vampiric level. Yeah. And, and with that song, were you guys doing that all? I remember seeing you at, at Lupo's in Providence, as I said. And were you always inviting Tom York onto the stage for that? I think he did. Um, yeah, I think he did a lot. I mean, at some point during the tour, he started doing it every night. But I can't. I feel like it might have been the last half of the tour, probably. Yeah. And then we also did stay all together both bands right. a couple of a few times whatever happened to that guy's band to tommy York. <laughs> yeah i know yeah <laughs> this is we actually have a, a an in-band joke that open for belly and you're rocket to start <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like Why, who cranberries, else? cranberries and, open? yeah and and muses too it actually starts yeah. with the muses because that was like the pixies the sundays <laughs> yeah that's funny <laughs> yeah was that strange for you to watch his rocket ship take off, or did you know no, from I the get-go? We knew. We, yeah. I, we knew. In fact, Tom Gorman and I watched their sound check the first night, and we were both just like, I think Tom just went, these guys are going to be huge. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I was thinking, this is, this is going to keep us on our toes, this yeah. tour. <laughs> and did it? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's definitely. great. Yeah. What did you think of Courtney Barnett and Kurt Vile's cover. I think it's great. It's really good. Yeah, I mean, I love both of them. That's one of really, honestly, the most flattering things. Yeah. The most exciting things that's ever. Is that one of the more popular cover songs that somebody does of yours? Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. And, and you have <clears throat> a lot of experience with covers, too. Mm -hmm. I remember even back in, there was that Hendrix tribute that Belly did, Are You Experienced? On, yeah. Right? I always wonder about when they do tribute albums, do the artists get to have their own say if we want to do this? Or does somebody say, you're going to do this? Um, we had very sort of eccentric choices. Um, the Hendrix one, I think it came down to, um, here's what's left. Because uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> people had had dibs pretty early on. Mm -hmm. um, but we were psyched for that one because that one, that was a no-brainer. I love yeah, that song. It's right. exciting to it play. It is a cool and cover. I love that song. The rest of the covers that we've done have been all our own personal, you know. Right. Because the, uh, the one that my friend Adam did w with you was the Neil Young one. And yeah. you got the best song. <laughs> Not the best song, but when, it was like so perfectly well, suited Well, actually, when Joe came to me, I was like, he, you know, I did say, can I? Can yeah. Please do heart. Please, please. A lot of the songs that Belly did as covers and that I did solo are very um, sort of nostalgic. It's a you know they're it's a nostalgia trip most of the time because it's stuff you know. Think about your troubles is from the point by Harry Nilsson, which was m hugely important for the Gorman family and my family when we were little, and so that was sort of a nod to that and. Heart of Gold is was a sound, you know, that's one of the first songs I remember ever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of those are sort of based on, like, I loved this when I was a kid. Right, right. <laughs> so you, you do your solo career for a number of years, and at what point do you say, let's give this belly thing another try? Well, I know the answer is 2016, but what, <laughs> where were you? Uh, mentally in your relationships with all these folks in the band that you decided to try it again? I'm trying to, I mean, it was sort of off and on over the years we've, in different factions, we've discussed the option and it just never, 
you know, logistically and practically and emotionally, we just weren't all in the same place. And then in, two, I think it was 2015, I just, it came, I had been writing with Tom for the swan, for my Swan Song series, which was my last solo effort, as they say. <laughs> well, um, I, I love that and then, one. Oh, thank it's you. It's a lot of Crazy, lot of too. Songs. Yeah. There's like. A lot of people involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking um, of spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I no, not you. at all. Um, and then Gail also and I had been writing, Gail and her partner Chill and I had been writing for that as well. And so I think, you know, Chris just sort of said, we could just connect the dots here and and give this a, what would everybody think about doing a reunion? And we started an email thread and which quickly became very funny and fun. And we just sort of committed to practicing at least to see. Um, and so we did and it felt great. And so we, we booked it. That's amazing. Yeah. It's funny too that the belly reunion comes right after the swan song series because <laughs> you know you take something like belly which has and this is something i want to get into briefly though is like such a stated aesthetic in cover art in song mm. titles in album titles in production sound and then the swan song which is just all over all the place the <laughs> yeah so but how how much how much discussion is there for you know, keeping the belly aesthetic because it's something throughout those three albums and throughout the span of 25 years that has seemed almost effortless. Yeah. Know? Well, that was something that absolutely we talked about um, as we were doing things. I mean, Chris, Christopher Gorman does all, Chris Gorman does all the photography and then Gail and Chill have been doing, you know, design. Chris has a very strong aesthetic style and sense. And I think he and Gail and Chill were very just very smartly moved it forward while still keeping it, you know, it makes sense, this third batch visually, but it it feels like us, but it is different. And I feel like that is the, the same with the music, you know, right. it sounds like us, but it is different, right. a, you know, but if you put them all together, it all, it's the same story. Yeah. It's the same people. Yeah. <laughs> it's the yeah. same cast of characters. It's the same narrative it's the same you know it which is kind of kind of nice it really does feel like a series whereas the swan song series what held that together really is my friend sue mcnally who's an incredible artist it's her art which i sort of said you know every ep is going to have her one of her things and this is what the only thing that's going <laughs> to tie this collection of songs together is the visual <laughs> that's right. what's going to be the constant All right and so you know you guys started practicing and, and you did the reunion tour first before you even delved into new material right mm -hmm. so at what point in the tour did you realize we can we can make this work with something new well we did actually have four songs ready to play live oh, for okay. the first yeah for the first reunion just for our own for us we were sort of like let's just have some new stuff to play so it doesn't feel like purely like a vanity project we had four songs we played two of them regularly and then would pop the others in and the, initially we were going to just do it like a digital EP with and then just decided at the end of the tour that we would just keep writing because we were still you know Tom was still standing we were still sending things to each other right. Gail and Tom and I and so um, let me see I see we're almost out of time but rapper belly what, uh, what are your thoughts on the rapper yeah. belly and when did you first become aware of him and I first became aware of him when when our face started popping up on bands in town for his shows <laughs> and vice versa. Um, Was there a nervousness there? I don't know about this game. Yes, yeah, yeah. we were sort of, yeah, oh yeah. Well, we, we started getting, it It was online that we would start. Um, so I see you're playing in Detroit. Or, yeah. No, we're not. And it, you know, it's been, I'm sure he's not crazy about it, you know, and we're, it's, it's, it's a little tricky in terms of just, there's a lot of dam minor damage control or not dam, but people buying tickets that right. they didn't want on right. both sides and right. just sort of being very clear at all times. This is us, not him. Or yeah. this is him, not us. Yeah. And you're both but from the I mean, U.S., so you can't do a Belly U.K. or something. He's or, Canadian. Oh, he is? We okay. could do a Belly U.S. We talked about, you know, could, or he could be. Belly CA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
he, we both have, because we were on hiatus, what I'm now calling hiatus, which yeah. was actually a breakup, but because we were gone for so long and he started using the name and we weren't uh, aware, um, we both have legal rights of use. Mm, interesting. Um, so you both have like examined yeah. this, the legal aspect. I, yeah. yeah. And so, I, I mean, honestly, we're not feeling particular. We're never, we're feeling particularly litigious about anything. So right. it, it's just not. Right. Not an issue. It, it's an issue, but it's one that we just sort of throw our hands up when it. it it's almost comical. I mean. It is. <laughs> it, it is. Tanya Donnelly, navigating the landscape of the music industry in 2018. Thanks for listening, and thanks also to Tim Scholl, who designs the graphics for this podcast, to Gabriel Reifert Cohen, who masters it, and Andrew Walls, who does a fair share of the editing here. Remember, check out the Roaring Crowdfund preview and subscribe so you can know when we launch. And please write a review, too. Talk to you soon. <laughs>